Any of our Connors show up? Okay. All right, so we'll go ahead and get uh, started. Um, so today we have a special guest, which I will um, uh, introduce in a minute. But before I do, let me remind you, I still can't print. Uh, I've been told I'll be able to print by the time the day is over. My goal was to have the slide deck printed for you so you could actually take notes on it, but that didn't happen. Um, actually, I came into my office this morning, my ceiling was laying on the floor. So I ended up having to clean the mess up and get maintenance over and whatnot. So I will try to get the physical copy printed for you because I think you should have a printed copy, but I'll also make sure to share that with you so that you will have it. Um, it's very detailed, it's a lot of slides, and it's important stuff. So today we cover everything there is to cover about rail, okay? So I focus on ships and to a certain extent trucks, uh, mostly maritime, but I do not focus on rail because we are fortunate to have, as a graduate of Virginia Wesleyan University, I think probably the smartest trained person on the planet. Um, and I would say, I'm not saying that to uh, to uh, you know, boost his ego or anything like that. But I will tell you, I don't know that I've ever met. I've met people at CSX, Norfolk Southern. I've met train people. Never met anybody that knows rail as as uh, as much. And I'm not again not exaggerating, being dead serious. And I figured, you know, for that one, uh, I'm pretty good at ships. I'm pretty good at trucks. I'm not as good. I'm average at rail, but compared to Pat, I am a novice at rail. Um, so Pat Suttle is uh, from Suffolk, Virginia. He graduated in May, May of 2019 yes. from Virginia Wesleyan University. He currently works in sales. So if any of you are interested in sales, he's, uh, that's his thing. And he is, again, he's our leading expert on rail. So we're going to have a presentation from him and then question and answer uh, session afterwards. Uh, also, as I mentioned before, Rail does take up a, a chunk of our final because it's one of the three major modalities we study. And Pat writes the questions for that part of the test. <laughs> so if you have questions, um, he won't make up answers like I do. Um, <coughs> if you have questions, Pat will uh, be glad to answer those. And I have stalled for the Tylers as long as I can. So Pat, it's, it's up to you now. Thank you, sir. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Good. Good. That's excellent. Thank you all for coming here today. As Dr. Gould has mentioned, my name is Pat Suttle, Virginia Wesleyan class of 2019. I recognize a few of you out in the audience who I've taken classes with in, in the past. It's great to see you here. Uh, today we're going to be talking about how railroads impact logistics both domestically and globally. But before I get into the presentation, I was a business major here. Quick show of hands, how many of you are business majors here at Wesleyan? Oh wow, majority of the class, that's awesome. It's a great major and you can go just about anywhere with a business degree. After graduating from Virginia Wesleyan University, as Dr. Gould has mentioned, I am now working in sales, working in the Hampton Roads area through a company called Hill Manufacturing, which is a chemical manufacturing plant located in Atlanta, Georgia. I am one of the local reps, my dad is a rep as well, so I get to work a little bit side by side with my dad. So if you're interested in sales, it's a very good field, but it's also a hard field. It's a hard field to work in. So um, if you're up to the challenge, I'd give it a try. So let's go ahead and talk about our railroads. A common question is asked, how often do we rely on our railroads? Stop and think for a moment. Both our domestic and global economies rely heavily on our railroads to transport large amounts of material in bulk form and final products, and passengers long distances. Now, what started long distance train travel? Well, for the ones of you who remember from US history in high school, you probably talked about the Transcontinental Railroad, which was completed on May 10, 1869 at Promontory, Utah, where Union Pacific and Central Pacific met where they drove in the last four spikes. The photo that is here in the corner is the most historical photo of this accomplishment. As a side note, May 10th, nowadays, is National Train Day that was started by Amtrak, which I'll talk about later. It is now a nationwide holiday to celebrate this important accomplishment. And that's a day where you can just go out, ride the train, and even watch the trains if you want. 
Now, what is carried by train? Stop and think a minute. A lot of our everyday items that we see in this room, or even some that you have on, are transported by rail in some way. It's the cars that we drive, the steel that's used to manufacture cars and construction equipment, as well as locomotives, the fossil fuels to fuel our homes and industrial plants, the clothes that we're wearing right now to go to school or to work, and the food we eat at the dinner table. Now the first part we're going to talk about is freight trains. We're going to be looking at different engines and cars that, that, that we see transporting our freight long distances. Before we get into that, there are two different types of trains that we see. Some people say, well, Pat, I see coal trains all the time, I see other levels all the time. Well, that is a general term, but there is a more specific term. The two types we see are unit and mixed. The unit train is defined as a train that transports one specific cargo. Coal is an example, grain is another example, as well as containers which we'll talk about all of that in just a few minutes. Now the mixed freight is right in the answer. It's a train that carries a wide variety of cargo. A few examples to support are fossil fuels, lumber is a good example, the electronics we use every day, and even scrap metal to go to the recycling plant. I'll give you all a second to write down a couple of minutes. Now we talked about the different types of trains. What pulls the trains we see? Well, I see cars all the time, Pat. I said, well, you, you see big engines pull these trains. There are two main factions of locomotives within the North American continent. They are General Electric here on the left. As a matter of fact, it was founded by Thomas Edison. And Electromotive Division is on the right side. Electromotive Division was named recently changed to Progress Rail a few years back. So it was a most recent change. The General Electric locomotive on the right, on the left side, excuse me, is actually a rebuilt locomotive for Norfolk Southern that GE rebuilt for them in 2018 at their state-of-the-art Fort Worth plant. The EMB locomotive we have on the right side was built in 1973 for the Penn Central Railroad, and now it's under Norfolk Southern right now. The GE locomotive has 4,400 horsepower, so it's a pretty good size uh, locomotive with a big prime mover in it and the EMD locomotive has 2,000 horsepower. So locomotives like these are relied on heavily to move our freight to long distances. Now, when we see trains, we see lots of different types of cars. Why do we see different types of cars? Well, because every car that you see on a train carries a specific commodity with a specific purpose. And here's just a list that we'll be going over today. The first two cars we're going to be talking about are box cars on the top and a refrigerator car on the bottom. A box car transports general merchandise that needs to be kept dry for the element, including the paper that we use to print our documents, televisions to watch train videos and maritime movies, um, the cell phones that we use to communicate with each other, and the computers that we use for clerical duties. Now, a refrigerator car, in simple terms, is a refrigerated boxcar. It just has a refrigeration in installed. They are used to transport the foods that we would find at your local grocery store. Juice is a good example. Potatoes is a good example. As you see, this free first label Tropicana. I did a project on this um, last year, as a matter of fact. Uh, CSX had a huge contract with Tropicana to move the juice from New Jersey to Jacksonville and back. Uh, they carry all the juice going from north to south, and this part makes up a lot of revenue for CSX. Coal hoppers. We see a lot of these because of one place. Norfolk Southern's um, coal terminal, known as Pier 6, just on the other side of Old Dominion University. These cars are used to carry coal. They're also used to transport sand and gravel long distances. Here about a summer or two ago, I catch a nice long strip and has coal cars that are bound for Pier 6 up in Petersburg, which is an hour from my house. And this train, as a matter of fact, went through my whole city. Now you just saw the open top hopper. <coughs> this is the covered hopper. The only difference is it's a hopper with a cover on top of it. <coughs> a covered hopper transports grains that need to be kept dry from the elements. A few examples are wheat, pesticides, and fertilizers. 
This is one of the newer cars that Norfolk Southern purchased about a year or so ago. I catch a few of these in North Carolina. A car that we don't see common in this area, but we see a lot of these in North Carolina, they're called wood chip hoppers. Wood chip hoppers haul large amounts of wood chips and sawdust from place to place. These hoppers transport the wood chips to power plants and also mulch plants. Because some power plants are powered by wood chips to provide electrical power. Uh, Dominion Generation and Franklin is a good example because they went from coal to burning wood chips. And it burns a lot cleaner and better for the environment. Uh, a rarity for, for the Pansburg area, I got one of these southern wood chip cars this past summer on CSX. Really surprised to get one of these. The next car we're going to talk about are gondolas. As you see, I have two different types of gondolas. Each one serves a different purpose. We have the traditional gondola and a ballast gondola. The traditional gondola, as you see on top, transports loads including steel coils, scrap metal, and long pieces of pipe. And these cars have removable sides for easy loading and unloading and plants. Now, a, the ballast gondola that we see here on the bottom has a load of ballast. This one is different because this is actually powered by remote control. Received as an electrical current from the locomotive, the operator can dump that car on either side to dump the ballast wherever the track crew needs it. These cars are mainly used on track products when they're working on the track. So if you ever get to see a track crew that's actually working on the track on NS, CSX, Amtrak, or anybody, it's a really neat show to watch. You don't see it very often, but when you do see it, it's definitely worth the show. Another car that we see a lot of, tank cars. The fossil fuel business is growing here in the United States, so tanker cars are relied heavily with the railroads. Tanker cars carry a wide variety of commodities. They carry the gasoline, propane, crude oil out in the Midwest, vegetable oil that we use to cook our food, liquid soap to wash our dishes, corn soap that's used in manufacturing soda pop, wax to manufacture Crayola crowns like we used as kids, chlorine and petroleum gas. And these cars will have a sign that tells you what's in that commodity. You see this plaque right here that tells whoever is unloading that tanker of what's inside that tanker. For a couple of examples, 1987 is used to fuel our cars, that's regular gasoline. 1993 is diesel fuel used to, uh, hold the big, to fuel the big trucks like Cascadia or Mack truck. And 1093 is liquid propane. The next topic we're going to talk about are flat cars. There are four different types we're going to be looking at. First, we're going to be seeing the traditional flat car. And they are used to haul wide and oversized loads. And you see I have a couple of examples. New sections of track, which is a fairly new one, and trash dumpsters. I'm going to focus on the trash dumpsters here for just a moment. The landfills up north in New York and New Jersey are very full right now, and they can't hold trash. So, Waste Management and CSX have a contract. CSX will bring the trash loads from, from the north to south in the Petersburg area, and Norfolk Southern will take them to the nearest landfill and get them dumped. Then Norfolk Southern will bring them back for CSX. CSX has actually gained a pretty good amount of revenue through this service. The next two we're going to talk about are bulkhead and super flat cars. Now the bulkhead flat car has the same purpose as the traditional flat car, but with the exception of these two raised sides. These two raised sides prevent the loads from shifting forward and backward. And right here on the bottom is a super flat car, or known as a low boy, like a low boy trailer you would see at, uh, with a construction company. They are used to haul the, the massive oversized loads, including a gas turbine. This, is a, this was a fairly new one taken a couple of summers ago in Petersburg, and I was really glad to get this because, as you can tell, this car came right off the assembly line. Another car that we see in some places is a center beam car. The center beam car transports lumber from the sawmill to your local hardware store, like your local Lowe's or your local Ace. As all of you know, lumber is used to build our homes, college campuses like this one. 
wood crafts in the wood shop if you guys build anything out of wood, and also other commercial buildings. The center beam only serves this single purpose. As you can see, this one is loaded with lumber heading south on CSX. Now, a car that is slowly coming back on the rail industry, pretty much within the past couple of years, is a coil car. Coil cars are used to carry the steel coils to manufacturing plants. Just to name a couple, General Motors is one, Ford is another, General Electric is another one, as well as EMD. As, as a couple of years ago, the steel business has recently increased in the United States. Uh, you know, U.S. Steel opened up one of their plants and brought about, about I think, two or three hundred workers to keep that plant running. So that's American Steel rolling on America's rails. Here is an example of which one looks like. As you can see, this is the cover that protects those coils from the elements. And I caught this car on a manifest in North Carolina on Norfolk Southern. The next car we're going to talk about are container cars. We see a lot of these cars thanks to our local ports, which we'll get to in just a few minutes. The container cars transport these containers from coast to coast with up to three in each car. As you all have learned from class, you have learned about three different types of containers. The 20-foot, 40-foot, and 45-foot containers. There is also a 53-foot container, which is the size of an average truck trailer. Since the containers are stacked on top of each other, as the picture illustrates, the containers are held together in the corners by a pin in all four of these corners to keep that top container from falling off. Here I see a CMA CGM container, which I understand y'all are going there this week. This was on CSX taken on my 23rd birthday. And the crew was friendly on that one, although it was CSX. Be nice. Next, we're going to be seeing our spine cars. It's a different type of intermodal car that carries not only containers, but the truck trailers, as you see here. As you see, this truck trailer is 53 feet in length. We're going to be seeing the UPS trail in CSX later in the video, and later here in the presentation. Now, a car that has been actually beginning to phase out a little bit are the auto rack cars. And the name is right in the title. An, auto car, an automobile car or an auto rack transports new automobiles from the assembly plants to the distribution centers across the United States. These cars are equipped with two levels and they can hold about 12 new automobiles per car, which is very efficient. And these cars, as you see, are protected on the sides and the top to keep those new cars dry from the elements. They're equipped to unload from either side, so when they get to a distribution point, they're, they're unloaded, and they're put on trucks to the nearest dealership. And we do have an example in the Hampton Roads area. It's in the Petersburg area, which is about an hour from here. This is Norfolk Southern's automotive distribution point. The new cars are coming out of Kentucky, where the Norfolk Southern crews will settle off. The staff there will unload them and put them on trucks and take them to the nearest dealership. This tunnel is busy all the time. I've passed over a million times since, I've been, since I was a kid. Uh, and every time you're seeing lines of auto rack cars just waiting to be unloaded. Now, before I talk about the caboose, some people have asked me, Pat, have the railroads changed? Yes, they have, but they haven't changed that much. But one car you don't see anymore is a little caboose. The caboose was the last car of every freight train. The brakemen and flagmen were on the train to inspect the train for defects, which we'll talk about later. Here I do a little video on the life of the caboose, and this caboose is in fact set up at a local railroad museum about six minutes from my house. So you are seeing local history in this presentation. As we are now in the interior of the caboose, as you can see, this was the home away from home for the train crew. They had a furnace to keep warm. The head, of course, a refrigerator to keep things cold, safe to wash their hands, a little soaps, prepared meals. And this is where your train crew sat. The conductor and brakeman were in these two seats. This is a little desk where the conductor or brakeman would do their paperwork. Here's a little drop box where they could organize their paperwork. And their responsibility was to check for defects in the train. This is a bay window caboose. 
Because if you see out of this window here, from this angle, the conductor can see the left side of the train. And on the other side, it's the same thing. You can see the right side of the train. As you can see, these are his gloves of what he would wear, a sample of his paintwork, and the dishes to eat dinner. The caboose was wired in all railroad operations. This is the deck where the conductor would be seated out from the back, as you can see here. As you all can clearly see in this video, that the, the caboose was heavily relied on back in the early days of railroad. A lot of places are not using cabooses anymore because of the improvements of technology, which we'll get to in the next slide. Now, as I just mentioned, technology advancements have, have pretty much eliminated the caboose over the past 40 years. The new devices the railroads are going with are defect detectors. They're installed along the track to detect for defects. And I provide a couple of examples here. Dragging equipment means something that's dragging along the track. Excuse me. A hot axle means when a wheel is locked up and it's not turning. And also gives the axle count on the broadcast. The railroad started using these in the 1950s, but they didn't start regularly using these until the 1980s. Since the technology advances have improved, the sightings of a caboose are extremely hard to find. Uh, Norfolk Southern and CSX primarily in this area are still using a caboose from time to time to perform local operations. <clears throat> and a computer program is installed on all defect detectors to broadcast a few examples that I have here. The broadcasting of the temperature, how cold or hot it is outside, the axle count, the milepost number where it, where it is located, and the length of the train. So I'm going to shift over so you guys can listen to a sample of this. This is actually a local defect detector in the Petersburg area that a friend of mine recorded. And this defect detector has long been updated. Take a listen. As you just heard, you heard the location of the defect detector and the milepost number. A train is going through it, and you're going to hear the official report momentarily. defect detector, you heard the axle count, which is 56 axles, and the temperature that it was outside. 56 axles is, was about average for an Amtrak train, and we're going to be getting to Amtrak here in just a few minutes. Now, before I go to the next slide, as some of you probably know, I pick on your professor all the time. I pick on him for, just a, for several different reasons, and this is actually one of them. Are trains more efficient than trucks? The answer is yes. Sorry, Professor. I do love a Kenworth W900 and a Mac R model as well as a Mac Pinnacle, but they're not as efficient as a, truck, a train. The answer is yes. Why is the answer yes? Because trains can go from point A to point B on a single gallon of fuel. That means less congestion on the highways, and the roads are a little bit safer, and we burn and consume less fuel. This explanation above is going to be very important when I go into a real-life scenario here in just a few minutes. Now, as trains are moving down the track, there are going to be times where a train needs to set off cars at a local industrial plant or a tractor that needs to do maintenance. Switching cars and tractors occur often on the railroads. Train crews and track crews will ask for a set of instructions called track authority. Track authority is a set of instructions issued to a train crew authorizing to perform specific movements. If a crew happens to need it, a conductor or, tra or track foreman will contact the dispatcher to ask him or her to use a certain section of track for the following. Switching cars, performing reverse movements for, tr for track repair, for a certain amount of time. 
You're going to be hearing a sample of this later in the video that happens to be something that I actually recorded. Now, we talked about railroads in general. Let's narrow it down to the railroads here in the U.S. We have something called Class 1 railroads. And Class 1 railroad is a railroad that is, that is present in the North American continent that also owns a majority of its tracks in the continent. And here is just a small list that we'll be going over today. The first one on the list is Norfolk Southern, my personal favorite railroad for the ones of you who've known me for a long time. Based right here in Norfolk, soon to be headquartered in Atlanta, Georgia. They serve 22 different states, as I mentioned a few of them above. <coughs> coal is the top commodity for this company. The coal gets exported to foreign countries through Pier 6. And the coal that comes through Suffolk and into Norfolk come out of West Virginia and the western part of Virginia. On the left, I see a coal train coming through Suffolk about 10 minutes from my house. More on NS, containers is the second commodity for the company. Most of the containers that are bound to the Norfolk area come from Chicago, Louisville, and Columbus. Here I have two different examples. The first intermodal train we have has the auto racks behind it coming out of Kentucky that were going to be delivered at Petersburg, as mentioned earlier. And the second one comes out of Portsmouth through the Commonwealth Railway, which I will get to the Commonwealth in a few minutes. Norfolk Southern third commodity is grain. And right now we're in the peak of the grain season, early fall to midwinter. The real life scenario that I have up here is really interesting. According to John Pike, operations director of Goldsboro Milling Company, produces 500 million pounds of turkey and pork every year. 40% of this grain is coming from Carolina farmers, and the remaining 60% is coming from the Midwest. Excuse me. Each week, 185 of these covered hoppers, as you see above, roll onto his site weekly. Given the grain's bulk and distance traveled, rail is the cheapest method of transportation. This is a bullet I suggest you take notes on. Given the grain's bulk and distance traveled, rail is the cheapest method of transportation. Regular deliveries keep his stockpile storage and inventory costs low. Let me do a little further explanation. This sentence here explains that a train can haul over 100 cars in one single trip on one gallon, on a one de, one gallon of fuel. One big tank of gallon. That's about a 5,000 gallon fuel tank on that locomotive. The train can go from point A to point B on that single trip with that single gallon of fuel. It's pretty impressive other than 25 to 30 trucks hauling a lesser amount every day. <clears throat> Norfolk Sellers competition, CSX. For the ones of you who have known me for a long time, I particularly don't care for CSX. CSX is the second class one great railroad that's headquartered in Jacksonville, Florida. And as a fun fact, the professor probably doesn't know this, but CSX was headquartered in Richmond for a long time. Uh, they moved out of the Richmond area in 2003 to, 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 to go down to their corporate headquarters building now in Jacksonville, Florida, which is the former Atlanta Coastline building. They serve Virginia and a few of the other states that I have above. Opposite from Norfolk Southern, their, their top commodity is containers. Coal is the second, grain is the third. The containers that are inbound to ports would come from Chicago and Columbus. Here I have two different trains that you're looking at. We see a manifest train taken in Ashland right across from randolph Bacon College. I don't know if you can see it right there, but they're the trash dumpsters that are bound for Petersburg. And on the right side, we see the UPS train on the right taken in Petersburg, which we're going to see later in the video. The next one we're going to talk about is Amtrak. Quick show of hands, how many of you have ridden Amtrak before? Okay, a few of you in this room. As everyone knows, Amtrak is America's passenger rail service. Amtrak was founded on May 1st, 1971 by the U.S. government to relieve all railroads from passenger service. Passenger service was in decline about the mid-60s to about 1970, and the, freight, and, the freight, and the railroads always concentrated on freight service, leaving passenger service behind. So the government came together and said, we can take over all the operations under one company, and that's how Amtrak was formed. The last, the fun fact is, the last railroad that 
gave up their, Am their, Am their service to Amtrak is the Southern Railway. The Southern ran their passenger trains until 1979, and they were the last to give up their service to Amtrak. They offer local services in a few of these areas. Norfolk primarily was just right down the road. Uh, about four years ago, they served about 31 million passengers. While, while they earned about $2.2 billion in revenue, Amtrak transport around 86,000 passengers daily. So Amtrak is vital to moving our passengers just from Norfolk to Richmond, or sometimes Washington, D.C., cross-country. And here I show a couple of Amtrak, just to show you what they look like. This is one that was taken in Suffolk right here, and the other one on the right was taken in Salisbury, North Carolina. Now we focused on the East Coast railroads, let's move on over to the western part of the country. There are two railroads out there. The first one is good old Union Pacific. Founded by our 16th president, Abraham Lincoln, in 1865, uh, right before the end of the Civil War. They are headquartered in Omaha, Nebraska. That's also grain country. They serve the Midwest and western portions of the country, as I list a few of the examples here. About 21% or $4.5 billion of the revenue comes from shipping industrial products. While a combined 38% or $8 billion account for intermodal traffic and agricultural products. Here I see a UP locomotive on lease to Norfolk Southern, which I'll explain about that in a couple minutes, right in North Carolina going north to Raleigh. Union Pacific's competition, Burlington Northern Santa Fe, now owned by Mr. Warren Buffett, they are headquartered in Fort Worth, Texas right where General Electric's newest plant is. BNSF serves the same territory as Union Pacific. Fun fact, in 2017, their revenue increased by 8%, bringing the total to $21.4 billion, a lot in today's money. As like the Union Pacific engine of the previous slide, this locomotive was on a lease to NS, and they paid BNSF to use the locomotive under horsepower hours, the number of hours they used for the locomotive. This locomotive was actually seen in Salisbury when I did my internship in 2018, um, waiting for a crew to take it north, coming out of Asheville, as a matter of fact. Now let's move on up north to Canada. We're going to be talking about two railroads up there. The first one being an all-time favorite, Canadian National, based in good old Montreal, Canada. They're one of two major Class 1 freight companies in Canada, and they serve Ontario, Montreal, and Quebec. And they also have parts in North America they serve, including Michigan, Illinois, Wisconsin, and Louisiana. A couple of fun facts on CN, they're the largest railroad in Canada in terms of both revenue and physical network. And they're the only transcontinental railroad that spans from the East Coast to the West Coast. Very impressive. Here on the other side, I see two locomotives on lease to CSX, taken a day before my 23rd birthday. Excuse me. The second class one freight railroad company is Canadian Pacific, or CP.